This is CBC Here and Now. Well, it was one year ago today that marijuana became legal in this country. What's changed and who's profiting? That story tonight and... Restart the environmental assessment process to ensure that the company's expansion plans receive the highest level of scrutiny possible. What I think they're asking for is to repeat environmental assessments on already approved sites. The Salmon Federation wants more scrutiny for a salmon farm's expansion plan after last month's massive salmon die-off. Why the aquaculture industry says that's not necessary. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. It was one year ago today that the country legalized marijuana. Well, is the grass any greener on this side of the law? Tonight, we're looking at the challenges over the past year as well as who's profiting. As you can see, Carol Stokes, they're live in downtown St. John's tonight at one of the very first places to sell crime-free cannabis in Canada. Carolyn. Thanks, Anthony. Yes, I'm here live at Tweed on Water Street. A real party atmosphere here tonight. There's a live DJ, there's cake, there are mocktails. So yeah, a lot of celebrating happening. And joining me now to talk more about the highs and the lows of the past year is CBC's Meg Roberts. So Meg, I can't believe it's been a year. One year. And it's uh, funny, I spoke with a lot of different people in this. They had very different views on how legalization went, but they all made that exact same comment. They can't believe it's been a year. Year. Now, at the beginning uh, of this year, we didn't exactly know what to expect with all of this, and now we have a bit of a better picture. Uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians spent $36 million on legal cannabis, and they probably would have spent a lot more. It made national news. The first legal marijuana in the country sold right here in the province. But the excitement quickly faded as storefronts struggled to keep up with the demand. Pot shops with no pot, which had private retailers asking how they would make money. My sales, we might have made $40, $50 profit yesterday. If things continue as they are, um, you're going to see the independents shut down. I'm a little let down with the supply problem for sure. So what happens when legal stores aren't getting the quality and quantity that people want? Well, they get it from someplace else. CBC News spoke with a recreational user who still buys from a drug dealer. He said after legalization, his dealer at least maintained their quality of service while also decreasing their price. The everyday user said the product he buys at Tweed costs about $12 a gram. His dealer charges him five. See you. Supply issues aren't the only reason. At least two independent retailers in the province say they've barely broke even. Licensed pot stores make 8% commission. They say it's not enough to cover their cost, so they want the government to increase that amount. We did enter into the business knowing that it was 8%, but of course when you get operating and you see all your expenses and the cost to operate a business, it definitely starts to add up. Um, I know for us, just even having an extra staff all the time um, was one thing we definitely had to commit to. In the first 10 months after legalization, the NLC recorded roughly $5.1 million in net earnings. And although they acknowledge there were some bumps in the road, a spokesperson says they did the one thing they promised people from the beginning. I do believe that we, we brought a safe, secure product. And, and I think one of the biggest things that we got right was we knew this would be an industry in its infancy and that we are going to reassess as we go. We knew we wouldn't get everything right from the start. So, Mega, a lot has happened over the past year, but what's coming next? Well, there are some pretty big developments. There are three cannabis facilities that are currently being built. The NLC believes that will help take care of some of those shortage issues. Also, edibles became legal today, as well as extracts and topicals. However, the NLC says you won't see them in stores like this one until the end of December into January. All right, thank you so much, Meg. This here now is Meg Roberts reporting tonight. And I have another guest with me, actually, someone who made history last year, Ian Power. You may uh, recognize his face. Ian, you were first in line right here at Tweed uh, last year, the first person to buy uh, cannabis legally in Canada. So it's been a year. You were very enthusiastic back then. Has it all lived up to the hype? Uh, well, yes and no. Some, some of the aspects have lived up to it. Uh, I would like to see more of a price drop, mm -hmm. you know, for pay for the recreational consumers. I'd like to see uh, 
in the coming years coverage for medical patients because you know you shouldn't have to go broke because you're in pain um, edibles start today you know became legal uh, I think 10 milligrams is a little bit low on the edible scale and should be bumped up because for patients 10 milligrams is not going to do very much for them a lot of people start off with that at 50 and if they're ten dollars for a an edible then that's fifty dollars a day right, right? Okay. so I'm hoping that uh, Whoever becomes the next prime minister, I've actually reached out to Jagmeet Singh uh, and asked for a sit, sit and talk uh -huh. and do a Facebook Live and ask him about how, what he will do for cannabis patients across the country if he becomes prime minister. Will we be included in that universal drug care plan? Will our medical cannabis be covered finally? You know, just you know, give it to the excise tax and the tax on cannabis because all other medications are not taxed. So why is cannabis? Okay, so you have a lot of uh, thoughts on this concerns. for sure. How has your life changed over the past year with the legalization of cannabis? I get recognized everywhere. Oh, you do? I really do, yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I went, uh, I'm away home earlier. I stopped in a gas station, get some gas, and uh, someone at the pumps was like, hey, you're number one. And I was like, yeah, high five, right? I'll be out getting groceries, and people will recognize me, especially when I have this combo on they're like hey man you bought the first gram and I'm like well not just me but it was also Nikki Rose she was here a year ago and I was the first man she was the first woman so you know I wish she was here tonight to celebrate the one year anniversary and uh, be, be here doing interviews just like I am right <laughs> well thank you so much for uh, speaking with me uh, Ian and uh, will you be first in line when uh, the edibles uh, become available in a few months you can bet on it <laughs> I will be number one <laughs> I definitely will I'm looking forward to it thanks so much and uh, coming up on here and now we're gonna speak with a spokesperson uh, from Tweed about uh, what's coming next we're gonna find out more about those edibles and extracts and topicals that are gonna be coming to market uh, in a few months. Reporting live for Here and Now from Tweed on Water Street, I'm Carolyn Stokes. A lovely start to the day today. We are starting to see some cloud cover push uh, towards the island. Some of that was high clouds and then more cloud covers moving in uh, over the next couple of hours and we can thank a low pressure system for that. We've been talking about it for the past couple of days it is going to weaken as it heads our way, but still prompting a number of warnings. We have wind warnings on the west coast, and we've got some special weather statements in effect for uh, mainly the Avalon, but we do have some heavy rain on the way. I'll have all the details coming up. Well, these two potatoes might look pretty similar, but they come from two different places, and one local farmer wants you to buy this potato and not that potato, and I'll tell you why coming up on Here and Now. There's more tonight on the controversial salmon die-off on the south coast. The Atlantic Salmon Federation is pleading with the province's environment minister to put a halt to plans by MOE to increase its salmon production. The ASF held a news conference today and asked the government to restart the environmental assessment of the expansion. Now, MOE is the parent company of Northern Harvest Sea Farms. That's the company that is still cleaning up the rotting remains of two and a half million dead salmon inside cages in Fortune Bay. And the ASF says MOE received government permission last year to expand its annual production of four and a half million young salmon, or smolts, to 6.7 million. It was waived through the environmental assessment process by the provincial government without being required to provide any details about what would happen to the fish or the environment they are to be placed in once they leave the hatchery. All we know is that a large number of additional smolts will be placed in the same sites affected by the recent mass mortality event that has triggered one of the worst water pollution events in Newfoundland and Labrador history. Now, Sutton says the Federation protested the decision last year by asking that the company be required to show the environmental effects from the existing cages and what would happen if more fish were added. And he says those concerns were ignored. Well, Mark Lane, the executive director of the Newfoundland Aquaculture Industries Association, says more scrutiny isn't needed. The site itself, or the actual marine harvest of Maui hatchery, Northern Harvest Smolt, that underwent an environmental assessment. What I think they're asking for is to repeat environmental assessments on already approved sites, which really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I'm not sure what you would achieve by doing that. 
Well, meanwhile, the Atlantic Salmon Federation is also critical about how Fisheries Minister Jerry Byrne has handled the news about all of the fish that started dying more than a month ago. The group says Byrne has not been up front with the public. The Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture, the minister who is charged with overseeing this industry through the author under the authority of the Aquaculture Act, does not need regulatory authority to tell the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, whose ocean is being affected, that there is a major environmental issue occurring. I think he has an obligation to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador to make these issues public when he knows they are occurring, and as soon as he knows they are occurring. We are farmers of the sea. We depend upon the sea for livelihoods. We depend upon it to feed the world. We should band together as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and help each other, as opposed to being divided and, and pointing blame at people and trying to you know, further agendas on the backs of hardworking farmers in Newfoundland and Labrador. It, it's, it's a sin. Now, we've been asking Jerry Byrne for an interview and have been told that he's not available to talk to us this week. But still with this story, is there a link between the growth of aquaculture and the demise of wild salmon on the south coast? Well, there was a retired DFO salmon scientist who was at that news conference today and he raised some concerns about that. Stick around for my interview with him in 25 minutes. To other news now, a teacher charged with sexually exploiting a teenage boy used her right not to appear in court this morning. Instead, Krista Grimes had a lawyer represent her at her first court date since she was charged in August. The Newfoundland and Labrador Teachers Association is footing the bill for her legal fees. They say Grimes was charged in relation to her duties as a teacher, but the union isn't paying for a criminal lawyer. Greg Kirby, who appeared today, usually does personal injury cases and civil litigation. Not much is known about the case. Grimes' case was set over until November the 8th. A repeat sexual offender has agreed to remain in jail after police picked him up earlier this week. 33-year-old Matthew Twine has a history of exposing himself in public, most recently to young girls. Twine will be in custody until his court appearance next week. The man has a 20-page long criminal record with offenses right across the island. And in a rare move, police went to court to have nearly 30 conditions placed on Twine, believing that he would reoffend. He was arrested within days after apparently breaching a condition to stay away from Memorial University. Twine was recently sentenced to more than two years in jail for repeatedly exposing himself to teenage girls at a St. John's dance studio. Well, Lyndon Butler is out of jail tonight. Butler, previously acquitted of murder in a high-profile killing, had been picked up by police over the weekend. He faces several weapons charges after police allege they found a loaded handgun during a traffic stop. Five years ago, Butler was acquitted in the death of his friend Nick Windsor. But he does have other convictions, including some for weapons offenses. The court imposed some conditions with his release. He has to stay in the province, adhere to a 7 p.m. curfew, and he is not allowed to have a cell phone or tablet. The federal New Democratic Party is outlining what it would do for Newfoundland and Labrador if elected. Premier Dwight Ball asked all party leaders for their plans. NDP leader Jugmeet Singh, the first to respond, he sent Ball a four-page, double-sided letter full of various promises. Here now as Katie Breen breaks it all down. It's at the top of Singh's letter, and it's understandable why. Muskrat Falls is a financial burden, and people here want to know what's going to happen to their electricity rates because of it. The NDP is pledging to work with the province to keep bills from doubling. It's promising a nationwide energy retrofit program that would save households hundreds of dollars a year. And it's talking about the possibility of giving Newfoundland and Labrador its federal shares of Hibernia to help offset the project's cost. We don't think that the full value of those shares has been transferred to the province. We want the shares themselves transferred. The renewed Atlantic Accord signed by provincial and federal liberals six months ago dips into federal Hibernia dividends. The deal is $2.5 billion over 38 years. Din acknowledges he doesn't know exactly how much extra money ownership would mean for Newfoundland and Labrador, but he says Ottawa has gotten its cut. It's tinkering at the edges, frankly. It's, it's fine. It's a good idea. Where you get the money for rate mitigation is, is up for grabs, but you've got to get the emissions down. And the NDP plan doesn't do it. 
The Greens say they'd cancel the Trans Mountain Pipeline and use that money to subsidize muskrat. Like the NDP, they also plan to tax the rich. One of the things that we've targeted is the super wealthy in Canada who have more than $20 million uh, in wealth and assets. We would tax the excess of $20 million at 1%. Singh says that would raise billions of dollars, some of which would be transferred here. His plan involves equalization to help pay for health care, working with the province and the Nunatsiavut government to mitigate methylmercury at Muskrat Falls, making it easier for workers to qualify for EI and providing funding for a new HMP. The Conservative candidate in St. John's East, Jody Wall, was unavailable for an interview today. Party leader Andrew Scheer has said he'd continue talks with the province around Muskrat and electricity rates. In a statement, Nick Whalen, the incumbent Liberal candidate, said the federal Liberals are working on a letter for the Premier and that the party is committed to keeping power bills affordable. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Newfoundland Labrador's minimum wage is going to be reviewed by a restaurant owner, a federal government employee, and a director of the Provincial Liberal Party's executive board. The provincial government has announced those appointments to a committee that will examine the $11.40 an hour rate. It's the second lowest rate in Canada, and its findings will be reported to the Advanced Education, Skills and Labour Minister later this fall. Under provincial legislation, the minimum wage has to be reviewed every two years. Well, a farmer in Happy Valley Goose Bay is trying to push local produce, but he's hitting a wall. He's got about 50,000 pounds of potatoes to sell this season, but he can't find any local buyers. Here now is Jacob Barker with that story. Ever wonder what it would feel like to be buried in a massive pile of potatoes? That's how Tom Angers feels when it comes to selling his product. It's always been a struggle every year. Angers says his local potato just can't compete with those coming from out of province. Well, we need uh, commercial farming in all regions of Canada. It's crazy to be trucking potatoes all the way from Quebec and, and other places when we can grow them right here. He says it's always been a rough go in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Between grocery stores and individuals, the local market doesn't give him the support he needs. The volumes are so small, 40 bags. By the time we bag it, load it, drive it into town, unload it, we're not making any money. We need to be selling full pallets, just Quebec. They don't buy 40 bags at a time from Quebec. You know, they buy four pallets at a time. And that's a shame because a new harvester bought thanks to some funding from the federal and provincial government makes picking spuds a breeze. It's really making life a lot better for us and it sure makes it possible for us to continue in a commercial capacity. Just ask Pastor Wayne Noble. He dropped by for the day to see the operation and ended up being put to work. Which I wasn't really expecting. <laughs> He's on board with local produce. Well, I think we all should uh, buy local if we can to support the local economy, and especially when it comes to anything that we can grow uh, within our own community. People should be tripping over themselves to eat a healthy potato, a local healthy potato. These two potatoes might look the same, but they're from two very different places. This one's from Quebec, and this one's from this farm right here. I did speak with one of the local supermarkets, which says it does buy local when the quality and the price is right, and sometimes it even pays more for local produce. But Angiers says that the real power lies in the hands of the consumers, and if they choose a local potato like this one more often, it just might help a local economy grow. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, local beekeepers handed over a pretty sweet gift to the gathering place today, a shipment of honey. Beekeepers Paul and Brenda Din called it a fantastic feeling as they handed over the fresh, sweet honey. The Community Outreach Centre offers food and support programs and health care to vulnerable people in the St. John's area. Now, it had originally planned on having its own beehive, but some people who use the centre's services also have very serious fears of bees. So instead, the company, Adelaide's Newfoundland Honey, is keeping the hive on their property in the Goulds. And by next year, that hive should be a honey-producing factory. We have a responsibility to remain um, as, as close to um, local produce as we possibly can. So we have a number of farmers that help us start our seeds. We, we use an organic uh, method of growing our vegetables. And so the honey really is in keeping with that. I mean, it, the benefit clearly to all of us um, of bees in our community goes without saying. 
next weather maker is on our doorsteps. We're looking at rain tonight and some gusty winds. I'll have all the details coming up. A lot of people talking about what a great day it was, mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to start with an early photo tonight. I am. I'm going to start with, uh, you know, you mentioned how nice it was earlier today, and this, I've got to saw a couple of these photos actually. Oh, it's nice. Online, yeah. So jo uh, Jason Morgan sent us this photo. This is a halo, mm -hmm. and the reason why we see it is just the sun's uh, refracting through the ice crystals up in high in the atmosphere or high in our atmosphere because uh, of cirrus clouds. So we certainly saw those move in today. It normally means incoming weather and that's exactly what's happening. So there's that cirrus clouds I was talking about moving through today and right now we're starting to see some showers. They started in the southwestern portion of the island a little bit earlier today. Now we're starting to see some for the Buren Peninsula. And if we zoom out a little bit, you can see just how large this system is, essentially spreading from eastern Ontario all the way through to Newfoundland and Labrador. And we've got a cold front extending all the way down across the Atlantic. So this system is quite large. And as we start to see it move towards us, it's actually going to weaken, but not before it uh, br does bring some pretty strong winds tonight. 
We do have a wreck house wind warning in place. Winds already gusting upwards of 116 kilometers per hour. They'll continue to strengthen as we head through the night tonight. Looking at gusts possible about 140 kilometers per hour. Anywhere really along the west coast where you're prone to easterlies, you could see gusts upwards of about 100 kilometers per hour. The south coast looking quite gusty as well. And then we do have a special weather statement in effect for the southern Avalon as well as uh, the eastern portions looking at heavy rain tonight and that will continue through most of the day tomorrow. So here's a look at those winds I was talking about. Gusts pretty likely between 190 to 100 kilometers per hour as we head uh, overnight tonight. The winds will eventually pick up uh, for the uh, east into tomorrow morning about 60 to 70 kilometer per hour and we could see gusts in excess of about 90 kilometers per hour and that's mainly where we're in those exposed areas. Overall as that low starts to move a little bit uh, further east those winds will ease for you along the west coast but they're going to stay quite gusty for most of the northeast coast as we head through the day tomorrow and even parts of central as well. So here's a look at that low pressure system as it moves are going to bring some of that rain heavy at times overnight tonight. Likely going to see the showers uh, heaviest in the morning hours for the Avalon. Otherwise, those temperatures are going to stay uh, relatively mild. Seven degrees for St. John's, eight in Corner Brook. And then as we head up through Labrador, uh, your temperature is significantly cooler for Lab City. Going down to zero degrees tonight. Could see some wet snow, about two centimeters possible uh, by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. And even more so as we head through the day tomorrow, as we wrap around some of that colder air, anticipating that uh, some of that snow will be wet through the day. Could pick up a couple more centimeters there as well. So here's uh, the situation rainfall wise into tomorrow morning. Uh, areas could see upwards of 20 to 30, maybe even 30 to 50 for some areas along the south coast here in the metro area likely somewhere between 20 to 25 or 15 to 25 millimeters of rain, but those temperatures will be quite nice. So 15 to 17 degrees across the board. As we head towards center, Gander might even see 18 tomorrow afternoon with temperatures in the teens for the rest of us. Up through Labrador, get into some of that colder air. As I mentioned, two degrees for Lab City, six in Maine, where you could see uh, some rain and even a few flurries in the mix. So it kind of feels like we flipped right into winter, uh, but Cape Breton's iconic Cabot Trail is one of the best places in the world to view the fall foliage. And it's an important part of the tourism industry. So now a researcher is studying how climate change is affecting the precise time the leaves change. Here's CBC's Kayla Hansel. Every year, fall leaves draw tens of thousands from more than 20 countries to Cape Breton Island. They come for the colors and the music. This festival is called Celtic Colors. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm from Michigan, and we have color, but we don't have tremendous vistas of color. As visitors flock to the trail, a researcher from St. Francis Xavier University is studying how climate change could impact the timing of those colors. I have a camera overlooking the valley. Lindsay Spafford is taking us to one of her research sites. She has cameras all over Nova Scotia, taking pictures of 300 trees every day to monitor the changing colors. We have been observing in, in the last few decades that uh, in the spring, leaves are uh, coming out earlier and earlier. Spafford is partnering with the Department of Natural Resources, sharing data to study the impact of air temperature and humidity on tree growth and the various stages of the leaf life cycle. Extreme weather is also a factor. Hurricane Dorian is being blamed for the brown pockets on some parts of the island this year. When the leaves are moving around rapidly, they might sever some of the leaf veins that transport water and nutrients to sustain the leaves. So we might see uh, a quicker process going from green leaves to brown leaves. We are concerned because we lost quite a few leaves then. And the CEO of Destination Cape Breton says understanding the timing of the fall colors helps tourism operators determine the timing of their season. We've been trying to encourage people to open a little bit longer, um, but if the leaves aren't there, that may impact uh, people coming to visit. For now, they're still coming, still capturing those spectacular colors.
I have like 20 pictures of trees in my phone now, you know. Like the music, the colors are part of the culture here. That's unlikely to change, even if the timing does and the tourism season is forced to adapt. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, on Cape Breton's Cabot Trail. The Con River stock, for instance, as an example, was producing somewhere around eight to 10,000 salmon. The last couple of years, it's been less than 500 salmon. That's less than 5%. That retired DFO scientist thinks that aquaculture has something to do with that decline. More on that coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. We're at the Atlantic Salmon Federation's news conference, and there was one gentleman who raised questions about fish, particularly in the rivers in the south coast. So, Rex, what are your concerns? My concerns with the salmon on the south coast is those stocks have sharply declined since the 
uh, late 1980s and into the 1990s. And this decline started about the same time as we had an, uh, an expansion of the aquaculture industry. And at the time this industry started, the Con River stock, for instance, as an example, was producing somewhere around eight to 10,000 salmon. The last couple of years has been less than 500 salmon, which is less than 5% of what the population was at that time. And my concern is that a lot of this decline is related to activities which occurred in the aquaculture industry. You used to work for DFO as a biologist. What are your other concerns about other species of fish? As you know, uh, Grieg has got a major project that's approved for Placentia Bay. Uh, Maui intends on restocking its cages. What about other fish? Yeah, I'm concerned that a lot of the effects that they're seeing in the aquaculture industry on wild salmon stocks is actually also occurring with other fish stocks that are not being monitored very carefully. There's an ecological change in relation to what's happening with those uh, around that ca those cages, uh, particularly with the effect of using uh, pesticides and and uh, in there, and and uh, also the problems that they have with. Uh, with parasites and disease, that these fish are being uh, exposed to those things, and we have a really change in the ecosystem, which could be affecting things like shrimp and herring and larval fish and lobster and, and shellfish in general. And these things are seen to be overlooked when we're looking at uh, the effects of the industry, and that these things should be examined as well very carefully. And this is why that the environmental assessment process is very, very important to get this all this information out so that we can all look at it and assess where the industry is going and try to put mitigative measures in place so the industry can survive and also have very low impact on the, the wild fish stocks. Light the Night is an event, uh, it's a signature event for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada. It's happening on Saturday night, the 19th of October, and it's a night where we bring hundreds, uh, we've got sometimes thousands, we have over a thousand people now registered to attend on Friday night at Paradise Park, and it's a night where we celebrate those who have beaten blood cancer, we support those that are going through a cancer journey currently, and we also remember those who have been lost to cancer. I think it was important for our whole student body to hear the three uh, young men's stories because everybody has a narrative and what students really need to know that uh, schools, adults, families are always here to support them and uh, so that's why we had this major assembly today to support Light the Night. It's such a beautiful experience to be set down in the audience and to see those three young boys up there talk about their experiences and they're teenagers and they should be having fun and not having the worries that they have. Um, but they've been through a lot and what got me most is that the three of them were on stage and they were smiling the whole time. To me, they're true heroes and to see their families in the background and the support from the school, um, the administration the students it was just it was very overwhelming you have a lot of reactions to the chemo so like no sores like fatigue you can't walk much like you're always very very tired and then certain you can have serious reactions I have my kidneys fail on me like I've had multi I've had migraines that lasted four or five days like it's just some of the reactions you get from chemo are not very good I hope people get more knowledge on the childhood cancer and what we have to go through and the amount of support that we need really because we are still young having such a strong disease in our body but I also hope that people will realize like that for light the night and donations like this that the money they're going to is to support people that have cancer it's not just going to some corporation. Well, today is the one year anniversary of the legalization of recreational cannabis. And today also marks the legalization of uh, cannabis edibles. Coming up on here and now, I'll speak with a spokesperson from Tweed about what that all means.
Welcome back to Here and Now. I'm live at Tweed in downtown St. John's where uh, there's a celebration happening. It's the one year anniversary of the legalization of recreational cannabis. And joining me now to talk more about the past year and what's coming up next is Courtney Langell. You're the spokesperson for Tweed. Uh, so you have a bit of a party going on down here tonight? Yes, we do. We have a party happening in all six stores in Newfoundland and thanks for coming and being part of it. So it hasn't uh, been a completely smooth year. You know, there have been issues with supply and that sort of thing, but how would you rate the success of the past year? It's been an incredible year of, of learning and milestones, and we're looking forward to putting everything that we learned in the past year into practice moving forward. What kind of things did you learn over the past year? What improvements can be made, do you think, going forward? Well, this is a brand new industry. Um, everything from the retail systems to the product to the regulations, everything has really been scaled up in this past year and it's been really important. So it's been a very architectural stage. So arguably we have a little bit to learn in every single area and I think there's there's no harm in that. We're looking forward to just getting started. Right. And we heard earlier in the show that the black market is still at play here. Uh, some cannabis users, you know, still go to their usual dealers. They say the price is better in the black market than it is, you know, getting the product in a place like this. How do you compete with the black market going forward? I think it's very important to include the legacy market in, in all of our conversations and just appreciate where we are. Um, we wouldn't exist without the risk that the legacy market took to get us to this place. Um, a lot of people have transitioned into the legal market from, from the, the black market or the gray market or legacy market. Um, I think what's, what's really important to remember is that this is a regulated industry and we're operating in a regulated framework. So all of our products are rigorously tested by Health Canada. They cannot be retailed until they meet those specs. So you have assurance in knowing exactly what you're getting. Um, our customers have the ability to choose from different profiles of products. Cannabis is a very individual experience, so it's extremely important for responsible use to know the potency level of products that work best for you, for your experience level, for the settings that you are consuming. And here you can do that in a very knowledgeable space. Uh, the gray market, they have no obligation to be transparent about their labeling. Uh, there's also no tr traceability of their product as well. Here we have lot numbers on everything, so if there is an issue, we can trace it right back to that lot. And there's just the assurance knowing that it's a quality tested product. Okay, so let's talk about going forward now because it's the one year anniversary, but it's also the first day that edibles are legal, not just edibles, but also topicals and extracts. Can you break that down? What does all of that mean? So we're adding four more legal formats to our, our family, which currently there are five legal formats. So we're adding um, edible cannabis. We're also adding um, extracts for inhaling and extracts for ingestion, as well as topicals, which are going to be applied transdermally. So how come they're not available today? There's an allocation of 60 days after today for retailers to really get a look at the full scope of products that are going to be available from licensed producers and just take their time being able to stock their shelves and hopefully they're going to be ready to retail in early December just in time for Christmas. And do you expect any kind of a supply issues to come about with this? You know, there were supply issues when uh, the cannabis first came out. What about when this new phase uh, takes effect? I don't think we have anything to be worried about. Uh, we have a lot of substantial partnerships and investments and a lot of people guiding us. And we've, like I said, learned a lot in the past year to really be able to build these systems very strong. And now we have the ability to anticipate demand as well, which was a huge unknown when we started last year because we didn't have really anything tangibly to forecast with. And, and now we do, so we're, we feel like we're in a very good place. Courtney Langell, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you so much. All right, that's it for me uh, down here at Tweed uh, tonight, Anthony. It'll be interesting to see how things play out going forward as uh, Christmas comes along and uh, those edibles come onto the market. Yep, and don't forget the free samples for the anniversary. We'll see when you get back <laughs> here. <laughs> don't go there. Okay. <laughs> Good, Good night, night. Carol. Good night. <laughs> We're going to shift now to some serious international news. A 93-year-old man was wheeled into a youth court in Germany today on charges dating to the final months of the Second World War. And descendants of some of the victims of the Stutthof concentration camp were on hand, including one man whose great-grandmother was killed in the camp's gas chambers. It's really our last chance to ever hear from uh, someone who was a guard at, at a concentration camp and to understand why did they do this. My grandmother constantly asked, why, why would they do this? How could they do this? 
Now, the defendant tried to hide his face from observers in the courtroom. Now, because the alleged offenses took place when the man was a teenager, his full name can't be used. He's accused of being an accessory to 5,230 murders at the camp near what is now the city of Gdansk in Poland. Prosecutors say he worked in the camp's watchtowers and stopped inmates from escaping. Stutthof was one of the last camps to be liberated in 1945, and this trial may be one of the last in Germany involving Nazi war crimes. A northern state in Brazil has declared a state of emergency amid fears a mysterious oil spill could leave permanent environmental damage. Puddles of crude oil and dead vegetation litter prime beachfront along Brazil's northeastern coast. And the toxic sludge has been washing up there for weeks now. Close to 200 tons have been cleaned up, and yet it keeps coming. The country's president has accused neighboring Venezuela of being responsible for this. An environmental group calls the spill the worst environmental tragedy in the region in decades. Welcome back. Well, Ashley, you mentioned it's going to be warmer in the near future, but also a little wet. Yeah, yeah. The, the next system's rolling in, which is bringing some warmer air. We'll take a look at where that warm air is right now. You can see temperatures in the single digits for most of us in Newfoundland and Labrador, but as you look into the maritime provinces, those temperatures in the teens right now, and that's what's headed our way as we head through the day tomorrow. Thanks to uh, the massive system, and I say massive just because of uh, how big it is. It extends all the way from Ontario uh, through to us, and it's going to continue to affect us over the next couple of days. It's really not moving much, but it is weakening uh, as it sits over us. So it's going to bring in some colder air up through Labrador, mainly Lab West tomorrow, which means we could pick up a couple of centimeters of snow through the day. It'll likely be very wet snow. Uh, but may accumulate certainly on grassy surfaces and uh, otherwise we're just going to see the rain continue as we continue in this southerly flow for the most part into the afternoon tapering to showers though through the day and some of that heavier rain will move up through Labrador and then continue 
like I said, through the day on Saturday. Now into Saturday, it's looking like we could see a few more peaks of sun in the mix, not quite as much cloud cover, but uh, that rain will continue up through Nain and it's looking like a couple of days of that. So Environment Canada does have a special weather statement in effect. We could pick up what I'm seeing anyway is upwards of about 60 to maybe even 80 millimeters of rain. I will certainly keep an eye on that over the coming days. Uh, but yeah, it sticks around. The cloud cover generally sticks around with that chance of showers uh, through the day on Saturday and even more so uh, through the day on Sunday with that colder air continuing up through uh, parts of Labrador into uh, into Sunday. So uh, taking a look at your forecast for Saturday, those temperatures a little bit cooler, sitting around 14 degrees for St. John, same for Grand Falls, Windsor, and then about eight degrees for Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Nain. You're gonna stay around five degrees, it looks like, which is why most of that will fall is rain and then cooler for Lab City. So I'd be sitting around three degrees with that potential for uh, some flurries sticking around. And then over the next couple of days, those temperatures are gonna drop. So here's uh, the five day outlook for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Uh, have a little bit of a sun icon in there for Sunday, hoping uh, that we'll see a little bit more sunshine. And then certainly into Monday and Tuesday as that low continues to pull away, we should see uh, best chance of sun into there. Uh, gonna hang on to the potential for rain right through Monday for central Newfoundland. Your best chance of seeing uh, mostly sunshine will be on Tuesday. And then for western uh, Newfoundland, you're looking at about six degrees for Sunday. And then jumping back up again as we head into the beginning of next week, about 10 degrees by Tuesday. And then for eastern Labrador, generally gray temperatures staying between seven and nine degrees with uh, rain. And then Tuesday, that sunshine should move in. And then for Western Labrador, again, keeping your temperatures a little bit cooler uh, with that potential for flurries right through Sunday. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, there's a farmhouse in Nova Scotia that was built nearly 200 years ago. It's surrounded by old barns and really beautiful trees. But there is one tree there that is unique. It was built by the owner himself, and he calls it tapestry. Colleen Jones explains. On his almost 200-year-old farm in Port Williams, Kevin Wood puts his produce in wheelbarrows and sells it out front on the honor system. This retired industrial arts teacher is old school, which is why I need to take you behind the barns for his art project called Tapestry. It's a tree fountain he designed and built himself, and you won't find another like it anywhere in the world. The tree is made up of 113 vintage taps. These came off of, a, of an old uh, bathtub from uh, 100 years ago. This old beer tap came from the old McDonald Brewery in Halifax. It's from the 1870s or 1880s. There was this tap known as a lock tap. It was uh, a whiskey barrel. People couldn't steal your whiskey. There are spigot taps, molasses taps, and the 113 taps took a lot of know-how to make it work as a fountain. Trying to do the plumbing, going from one line to 113 lines to feed 113 taps. Uh, kind of tricky. Meanwhile, in his blacksmith shop, he's making more leaves to fill the tree. But come on in here and I'll show you some, some interesting things. His grand plan is to turn all his outbuildings into craft buildings where people would learn how to create using their hands and using tools from a bygone era. I'm going to have classes here where people can come and learn how to make a barrel and how to do some blacksmithing and, and how to make a rope and a broom and uh, those are things that uh, I'd like to just uh, keep going. Technology from the 1800s. Oh, yes, yes. Kevin started collecting vintage tools when he was a teenager. His collection now fills three floors of this old barn. People have even willed him their tools. Some, like this bicycle-powered saw, could be considered green technology today. He believes in today's throwaway society there are some lessons to be learned from life back when his farm started in the 1800s, when sustainability wasn't even a word. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Port Williams. What a cool story. Yeah, um, it was fantastic. I like that, that was really neat. But uh, another beautiful photo to share with you, kind of looks like a painting. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Nicole uh, Gowdy sent us this wonderful photo and I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
Welcome back. Well, did you have you ever shown up to work, uh, arrived at home, and wondered who made this big mess? Did I leave something around? <laughs> a waitress at a restaurant in Moscow was annoyed with night staff for not cleaning up until she spotted the real culprit, and there it is, a young raccoon rummaging for snacks. Yeah, she suspects the fearless intruder is someone's pet. He's now at the vet. Uh, who knew who, or rather, who knew you could have a pet raccoon in Russia? I don't know, people love raccoons or hate them. There's very little kind of gray area, They're right? They're cute. cute, but... I wouldn't want but one. You wouldn't? No. A little pet raccoon? I saw my fair share of raccoons in Ontario. Oh, of course, yeah, you would have, you would have. <laughs> yeah, that's another have advantage for being here, there aren't any. We don't have any, that's right. As far as we know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, unless it gets in on something and yeah. travels here, but... Which apparently it did. It can happen. <laughs> that's another show. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's a look at our beautiful weather photo that I showed you just before the break there. Uh, this photo was taken in Springdale. Okay, you've been favoring that area of the province Have of late, I? yeah, oh. or of the island, I should say. I try and choose all that's around good. the island. Yeah, I know you're, you know, you're a Democrat. <laughs> um, that's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, so this is the sunset on the Indian River uh, hiking trail, and Nicole Gowdy sent us such great shot. Like I said, it looks like a painting. It does. Love the colors. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah. So weekend's already here. It was a short week. It was. Right? Yeah. After Thanksgiving. So mm -hmm. over an extra run or something. <laughs> uh, so tomorrow's Friday. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you then. Good night.